Hello again, this is Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher. Welcome back to beautiful Studio G. And this is part two. The number is number 885 in my tip series. I sincerely hope you watch part one, which is number 884. And this is all about the restoration, rebuilding, cleaning up, and you name it, of the Atlas Grinder Hone number 24. Now in part one, I explain many of the different parts here and uh, disassembled the machine and in this part I will reassemble, talk about different uh, problems that I ran into here and hopefully get this thing mounted on the board with a motor and in running condition and sharpen a chisel or a knife or something that I don't need done anyway. So hope you enjoy the video, leave me a comment and again, make sure you watch that part one, which I'll flash on the screen right now so you can get that, and the link is in the description. Okay, here's the exploded view that I showed you in video one, part one, and here it is totally disassembled, and every part has been thoroughly cleaned in solvent, and I'm ready to reassemble it. Now, I did not take the main shaft out or the gears out because it would require pounding out roll pins and tapered pins and all that. I didn't want to get into that because there's really nothing wrong with here with this uh, assembly here. And remember that the expense of this entire thing, $32 in 1955, probably revolved around the fact that this is a gear reducer, much like a Boston gear reducer that you could purchase still at great expense so that is the expensive part I will be replacing the grinding wheel as well I think I will begin this part by talking about the lubrication system here so remember that in this piece here which is upside down right now there is an oil light bearing there it is right there because it's a slow speed bearing these are the high speed ball bearings this is the low speed bearing uh, for the hone. Now I don't know if it was dry or not so what I've done here overnight I have pumped 20 weight oil in there and I've got a cork on the bottom which you'll see in a second whether or not that absorbs some of that oil I do not know I think they do it with a vacuum at the factory but let's start by dumping that 20 weight out and there you can see the cork and it is a number eight cork if you ever do this you will have to go and buy a number eight cork yes as if anyone would ever do it so I'll let that drain here wipe it off just a little bit and then it is ready to assemble now I'm going to add the 90 weight oil into the gearbox here and I'm not going to go through this hole that would be a nightmare for that thick oil so I'll just pour it right through the top but of course if you had to add oil with it fully assembled you would have to take this plug out and it would be wise to use a little street L in there if you know what I'm talking about so let's turn it around and again the directions and let me show you this because this is a real hoot I think to me this is absolutely hilarious that they would tell you here in the lubrication instructions to use 90 weight approximately one eighth of a pint that is so obtuse and crazy and you know what there are many people right now that could not figure out how many ounces that is and I don't expect you to raise your hand but sometimes we don't teach practical math like that or it's the simplest of fractions so really an eighth of a pint is two ounces remember a pint is 16 ounces fluid ounces so enough on that so I'm going to add that amount of oil roughly not that critical at all why didn't they say two ounces or three ounces I'm probably making too big a deal over this because what the heck difference does it make but I don't want to use the contaminated oil <laughs> so I'm going to get, again use 90 weight and this is a three ounce Dixie cup so I will fill it approximately uh, two thirds full in some ways I like the smell of 90 weight but in other ways it sickens me and it's all about that big boat trip that I took and I'll explain that if I ever do a video 
on our monumental boat trip down the Mississippi to Florida. So that's not what I want to talk about now, so I'll pour the oil right into here. My mother always told me to use newspapers or something when I work, and I, that really stuck with me. It really saves a mess. And looking down into the gearbox, I can see that the oil level just barely touches the bottom of the worm. Remember, there are two fiber washers, and one goes right here. And now I'll put the uh, flange back on here whatever it's called, with the oil light bearing, which looks to be in good shape. Now, I've had an obsession with witness marks all my life, so I reassemble things the way I took them apart. So there are center punch marks here. I'm just showing you a black mark and uh, marks on this as well. So this is the way it gets assembled. And by the way, there is no gasket, never was. I just looked at the uh, parts list and uh, they don't expect oil to splash up and leak out of there at that low speed I guess is what it's all about so I'll put these in and tighten them down Whoa. now I'm giving you a close-up right here and you can see that there's a lot of wear now whether this would machine this way with this little lip right here but I probably not I think it's just all wear and the fiber washer might well be reduced in thickness too because you know some grit got up into there but anyway that washer goes right there I think I'll put a couple drops of oil on both sides of it and then I'm ready to put the pan on there but I think I'll wait and do some of the other assembly first because I probably have to lay this on its side and I'm a little worried about it leaking oil when I do that so I will try to keep it upright as much as I can as I make the other assembly I don't see any oil leaking out of here when I do the final assembly, remember I want the motor to be behind it so the belt guard will be in this position, not the vertical position as it was when I took it apart. So this piece will be mounted, notice the slots here, the arcs, like that with two small screws. This is the ideal place to use the quick wedge screwdriver. I made a video on that, a lot of people watched. So you've seen these, I hope, just a perfect tool to use for this particular application when it's kind of clumsy and the camera's in my way and all of that. So look at how easy it is to get the screws started. And then I'll get the other one in there also, right down here. But do your final tightening with a more sturdy screwdriver in that these are somewhat delicate and expensive. This piece is simple enough. It just goes on like this. Should I have used oil on that or not? You know, it only attracts the, the dust. And then I will tighten the little set screw right here. If it is not at quite the right angle, that can be adjusted later on. And now let's put the grinding wheel on. And I made a really big deal in the first video and it was even a little quiz, I'm giving you the answer now. What is wrong with this wheel that I took off? Well, it's not cracked. So what is the problem? What is the safety problem? Well, it does not have blotters on it. Who cares? Somebody probably just said, what are these for? They're for packing and threw them away. So I'm going, I did not have, I could make blotters. But I do have this brand new in stock. I probably had for 20 years already happens to be a six inch and it comes with the uh, little bushings here because I had to ruin that small one it was totally frozen on with corrosion so I had to chisel it off so I no longer have the right one so I thought I'd start from scratch using a new wheel new old stock and this was twelve dollars uh, 25 years ago I don't know what they cost now master mechanic so I'll take that out of the package off screen. And by the way, this is a coarse grit. 
and the other one appears to be a uh, medium. But it is what it is. I'm sure you all know this, but you must always check a new wheel, or when you're remounting a wheel, to make sure it's not cracked. So you examine it carefully, which I already have done, and then suspending it like this, use a hammer handle, preferably a proto, and you will hear a ring. Now that's not going to uh, be noticeable by the camera microphone, but if it's just a dull thud, there's a crack in the wheel. And you must hold the, uh, the wheel by some other method, but this would be no good because you would be deadening it like putting your fingers on a brass bell. It's just not going to sound. So that's pretty important. And again, we got blotters on there, which are absolutely essential so that the flanges do not dig into the wheel. But sometimes these come loose in the package, and maybe somebody just threw them away. I don't know what happened a long time ago, but a lot of safety information here. There's your maximum speed. Well, we're not going to be that fast. And on goes the wheel flange, then the bushings, and then the wheel. Another flange, and the nut, again, that's fine, it's a half inch fine. And that will get tightened up real well by me holding the flat on the other end. I'll use a wrench on that. And it doesn't have to be terribly tight because these tend to be self-tightening. Right hand thread on this end and left hand thread on the other end, they tend to be self-tightening. And now the wheel guard goes on and never operate a grinder without a guard on the side. Sometimes they're removed for wire wheels and things like that. So, And there are two others that I will put in off camera. Well, I'm ready to put the tool rest on and I'm not really crazy about this design, but I have no choice but to reuse it. This is Zamek. And notice this bolt here. Some of you are going to say, yeah, why don't you put in a new carriage bolt? Because it's rusty on the bottom. This is not a carriage bolt. This is a, I'll tell you at the end, what is this bolt called? Similar to, well, no, I'll tell you now. Let's not be foolish here. That's an elevator bolt, I believe is the correct name. Correct me if I'm wrong. Now, there was a, a hex nut on the bottom, but the drawing calls for a wing nut and a washer. There was no washer on it, so it'll go on like that with this. Boy, that's, that's used. I've got to have a new one. And I'm using uh, new wing nuts uh, because I got a whole package that someone sent me. So those will go in there. And, you know, I just got so much of this uh, hardware and I'm 80 years old. What am I saving it for? My old age? All right, I took the old thumb screws out of there, and they were very hard to get out. I was afraid I might break the Zamac because what happens is uh, to this type of application is that the end of the thread gets mushroomed a little as it presses up against whatever it is. They should have been a dog point, really. And the same thing is true right here. Just, it's just all locked up. So that's why I put the new ones in, and I'm probably giving you too much detail. So let's take a look at how this rather strange <laughs> uh, tool rest works. This universal tool rest allows you to set it up against the side of the wheel, which for some people is verboten, or the periphery. We have some damage here. As you can see, this is Zamek. I just put in a new thumb screw as well, but it could be set up in a manner similar or identical to this. Maybe it could be reversed so you have the flat side up against the, the wheel and loosen this and it could be brought up close with because you've got a slot right here. Something like that. And the elevation can be changed as well by you know, raising it if you want it up on the center 
of the wheel. Now let's look at it in the normal position. So this is the way it would be used 99% of the time. In the other hole, raise it to whatever height you want it, lock it, move it left or right, in and out, I'll lock that, and then in and out, you would tighten the wing nut on the bottom here. Always rotating the wheel to make sure it is clearing because a new wheel, remember, needs to be dressed right away. They never run quite true, do they? And I guess I failed to mention that they can be tilted at different angles and tightened with this thumb screw. So it's really universal. I've never seen one like it, although it is not particularly rigid or well built, but the intent is great. Just a quick note here, it takes days and days to film something like this because uh, I'm not only doing the restoration but setting up camera and light and all of that. I always use a monitor but this is just a little peek behind the scenes to see how I do this. Well even though I'm not quite done with this assembly, I'm going to go ahead and mount it on a board at this time and this is the motor I'm going to use because I need to determine the position as far as the uh, pulleys diameters are concerned, the belt length, and all of that good stuff. But I have already made, at considerable effort and expense, a piece of th three quarter inch pine with the holes drilled. I've done that all off camera. And two coats of exterior spar varnish and counterboard on the bottom for the, because I'm going to use carriage bolts. And there's the hardware. And let me go ahead and get this mounted right here on these two holes. You don't need to see something like this. By the way, if you enjoy a video like this, let me know. Leave a comment, or is it too long or too detailed? Do you watch the whole thing? Should this be a five minute video instead of a 20 minute and all of that stuff? Please let me know because the views just aren't there for the amount of work that I'm doing here, although I love doing this. Guess what? I just got a visitor. It's 10.30 in the morning, and Henry brought over some nickel nips, one of our favorites. And, and he's actually going to share it with me. You know, he's, he can be pretty stingy with these treats, but, hmm. Oh, I can't get it. Hmm. I need to get blue. Ah. Pure sugar. Thank you, Henry. Say hi to the camera. Hi. <laughs> Well, time to get back to work. Henry slaked my thirst. Obviously, I did some alignment here off camera the other day, so there are the four bolts. And we'll put the little Dayton one-third horse on there, 1725. Like that. And of course, I've got washers and nuts. And then the final belt tension will be done in this manner. And I've already slipped the pulley on here. I do not know the alignment yet that is to come, as well as this one. And I already readjusted this bracket right here, which I had straight uh, horizontal, but we got a little bit of difference in height here between the sh center of the two shafts. So I'm trying to get, it's probably not that critical. And another thing is, I got a brand new belt here. The old belt is hardened and stiff and has a memory, so we will never get it supple again. You know what? I just said a quarter horse or third. It is actually a half, and at 1725, it is reversible. But in this configuration, the direction will be correct. The direction of rotation of the grinder is what I mean. So let's get the belt on there. I've got all of the hardware on there, but only finger tight. I'm sure you all know this, but it is important that the two shafts, this shaft and this shaft, are parallel to one another to prevent binding. And I've, we're not going to use a dial indicator or anything like that, but it, we just eyeball it, and I think I got it pretty good. And I did, in fact, use a 2x4 here to create the tension because this new belt is pretty stiff. I wish I had one of those that's notched. Also, I am in the process here of 
moving the two pulleys in and out so I have alignment this way and I got a little more to do yet but this pulley has to be far enough in such that the belt guard will fit over it and not rub or any interference so there's several factors here we won't go into that anymore but you've probably all done that back when you were in your prime as well for you wannabe YouTube creators here's a little bit of irrelevant nonsense you know look, look at the shadows here you really can't see anything but as I add just a little bit of light now granted it makes this so bright that it's disconcerting but at least we can kind of see what's going on in here probably doesn't matter but now I'm ready to put the guard on yeah, I got the screws started there are four of them and that just slips on I'll tighten those up and notice that there seems to be plenty of clearance right here I lost my light and here so that we don't have rubber dust flying through the air some people might find this interesting but I've already tightened these top two screws but I really can't get in on the bottom one so I'm going to use this little ratchet type screwdriver notice that it says it's Yankee North Brothers and this North Brothers was eventually bought out by Stanley so if you have newer ones it'll say Stanley on them notice that it's got a little starter screwdriver on this end and two different sizes and it's a ratchet on and off how ingenious is that for back in the 30s so I will use that to tighten this it's kind of awkward I won't show that and to all of the safety Nazis watching I know what you're gonna say we need a guard over this and you are right but it's not going to get it because it, let's face it I will never actually use this now will I and then the other thing there is no face shield here the glass shield that you normally use however in the directions which I have shown you in part one they made a big deal about wearing safety glasses and eye shields and all that but why in 1950 they didn't worry too much about things like that but these are two safety problems and then also there is no switch so for demonstration purposes I will just be plugging it in and uh, a switch should be mounted here someplace obviously but again it's not going to get that wow this video is long anyone actually watching okay I need to put the pan on here again that fiber washer it seems so thin I wonder if it's lost some of its uh, uh, and I'm gonna put a couple drops of oil on there for what it's worth and then the, I call this the pan I don't know what it's really called it's all cleaned up nice it is die cast and on it goes like that and the big old square nut which is serves two purposes it fastens the pan onto the shaft and it is the drive as I told you before to the hone which has a square hole in it seems crude doesn't it but quite effective so I don't think that needs to be very tight but I might no that's good enough now let's talk about this well I just heard a spite mower start did you hear it okay in the original direction on honing notice that the uh, stone has two sides one side uh, coarse at 120 and the other finer at 320 and the oil stone can be instantly reversed by lifting it off of the drive shaft and look what it says here now I'm not going to do this at least not now but I need to do it the oil stone should be soaked overnight in a mixture of half kerosene and half number 10 oil doing this prevents small blah blah you can read that but it also needs to be clean this thing is absolutely filthy and uh, I need to soak it in thinner overnight I should have done that for it but for demonstration purposes that will be done sometime in the future off camera all right let's install the teleprompter and you know there's a little interference here with with this but anybody goes into the hole right down here and then the teleprompter itself fits on in a manner similar if not identical to this and you can change the angle of uh, of which you wish to read <laughs> the text but mine's old-fashioned you have to write on it it's not electronic and then of course the filthy stone 
which really appears to be loaded. Now we're ready to run. Well, here's my switch for now. At the high school, I always talked about safety, and I told the kids when you change wheels, if possible, turn it on remotely, but if you have to be near it, turn your back to the grinding wheel and let it run a minute before you get anywhere near it. So let's plug it in, and I'm turning my back to it right now. You can't tell, but I am. And the wheel didn't explode. And, you know, it's running pretty nice, isn't it? That would take your finger off in a moment. My dad had a friend missing a finger. As I told you earlier, I have no interest whatsoever in using this grinding wheel. I'm only interested in the hone. By the way, here's the drive recommendations. A motor at least a quarter or a third, 1725. And the pulley on the motor should be three and a half to give you the speed of about 3,000 RPM. But in fact, my pulley is two and three quarters. I do not intend to buy another one. And uh, that, if we are at uh, three and a half pulley, we would get 110 RPM on the hone. So I believe this will be just a little bit less than that, but it's good enough for who it is for. And never exceed the speed right there. And it told us that also on the grinding wheel, didn't it? Since this is an oil stone, I'm going to put oil on it. Does that seem appropriate? And just to give you an idea, I'm not really going to sharpen this chisel. Matter of fact, that chisel is so bad that it really needs to be ground first. It's got a big old notch in there. I don't care. But let me plug this in now. And this is the whole idea here. Similarly, can you hear me? We could take this little plain iron, which sure does need it. I would have to set the angle on this, which I'm not going to do, but that is the idea. Always moving it back and forth. You know, it pays to buy the best, so I'm going to take this Taiwanese Bowie Knife Combination Fist Scaler bottle opener. It used to have a compass here and uh, I think a little roll of toilet paper inside or something. You know, it's a typical carnival piece of junk. <laughs> and I'm not interested in sharpening it at all, but let's just see what would happen. You know, it's very difficult to hold a consistent angle with a knife and that's what the teleprompter is all about, but I'm not going to use that. This is just for the fun of it. And of course, if I had the correct size adapter, this is 5 eighths, this is half, that would go on there and I could put a wire brush on there or a buffing wheel or any other accessory that you might think of, but I'm not too big on this type of thing. They never run true. If you've ever used one, they just wobble like an old wagon wheel. Well, that pretty much completes this video. It's a long one. I hope you watched part one and I hope you watched them all the way through to give me a little encouragement. If you did like it, be sure and give me a thumbs up. In the comments, if anyone actually owns one of these, and uh, let me know, because I, I, again, I think there's very few of these that were ever made. And you know, I put out a lot of videos lately, please watch them, but it's getting harder and harder because I have to look through cataracts, dirty, worn out glasses that are no longer in prescription, and the Optivisor, so, so it's getting harder and harder. Now, if anyone is interested in having this, you know, keep watching the newspapers because it will be available at my estate auction in about six months. This is Mr. Pete saying, so long for now, maybe so long for good. But I hope I see you next time. Lots of still pictures at the end. Be sure and watch those because I do go to considerable effort to do that. <laughs>